Here's an interview from one of our past shows on Rock and Metal Revival. If you're interested in hearing full shows, go to our Facebook page and check out our list of affiliates for times and places where you can hear Rock and Metal Revival. There's All Fools Sailed Away from the newly released Dio at Donington 87. And with us today, we want to welcome back Dio guitarist Craig Goldie. Welcome back to Rock and Metal Revival, Craig. No, oh, thanks, you guys. You guys are like family. This whole thing's been done like, like family. It's been awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's uh, great to have you back on the show. And now, Craig, with the release of this live Donington show, the new reissues, and, of course, the documentary Dreamers Never Die, does it surprise you how strong the Dio legacy is 12 years after Ronnie's passing? <laughs> no, actually. Um, because I think the the impact Ronnie had wasn't just his music. And it wasn't just his legacy or his reputation, but because he had such a long spending career over decades that his personal engagement with each every, each and every fan and the way he the way he dealt with them um, it's like I said before you know, people say heard me say this a million times that you know he would zero in on that fan uh, act as if they were the only one that mattered. Uh, zero in on them and know you know who what it was that made them unique so they had a special and unique connection right there and then with with he's only one but they're thinking all oh, this you know I, I don't matter I'm just some person and they walk away with a memory that they'll treasure for the rest of their lives and here it is and even in the Bible it says you can't change the city until you change the hearts of the people in the city so as Ronnie's gone from city to city to city over decades and decades, he's changed many hearts and people mm. in the city. Therefore, I think the city also itself, in many ways, has been changed. Yeah. And here we are again. So this doesn't surprise me, but I'm, but I'm surprised only by the lack of corruption. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, I, but I'm also very proud, you know, because... When he when he went back into heaven and hell, you know, with the, basically Sabbath, you know, mm -hmm. that was basically the mob, the black Sabbath mob rules um, lineup. I was so proud of him, and he was back in the twenty thousand seat arenas again, man. That was so awesome. He was so happy, and uh, there's just something about Ronnie where you it doesn't even matter if you're in the band or if you're his friend or a fan. The way he sang, his, his inflections, and his in his vocal performances, even if you never got a chance to meet him, you know him simply if you listen to his music and you love his music. Because, like I said before, his inflections are so, so real that, and they pierce the heart that the things that seem to make him mad are the things that seem to make you angry, and the things that he seems to be sad about are the things that make you sad. And so you develop like this friendship from afar, you know, and. Hmm. So it's just he's impacted so many people on, on so many different levels. It's just nice to see that in this day and age, after the pandemic, that's brought the worst and the best out of everybody. And customer service at an all-time low and people who care about people at an all-time low and corruption at an all-time high. But somehow, you know, well, I don't know some, I know why, because of the way these people have operated for the last decades. Hmm that this seems to really be kind of like flying under the radar of corruption and, and BS and just reaching people's hearts again. It's just nice to see. Cool. Nice, nice. Now, uh, what was it like playing with Dio at Donington? Do you have any special memories from that gig? <laughs> yeah, I was scared. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> S-H blank blank T <laughs> yeah. list. Uh -huh. You know, um, and uh, we were, we were, um, like special guests with Bon Jovi. So back in those days, they called it co-headlining, you know. Mm -hmm. And those guys came in on a on a helicopter, you know. And the guys from Kiss were there, and you know, and Richie Stambora came over and said, "Man, you know, go kick ASS for me, man." And I'm like, "Whoa, you know, such a camaraderie." Nice. And I'm standing on the side of my amps, getting ready to walk out, and I I hear Goldie, you know, look over and he's Ronnie. He grabs my arm, he looks at me real intensely, and he goes. Just remember who you are. Oh, and he cool. watched that guy. I was like, "Whoa, okay." Nice. And just because he knew I was scared, you know. Oh yeah. And on top of it, he knew it was what I was going to try to do. I think I told you guys this before, but 
I always thought how cool it was, you know, when a singer could, you know, the, you know, the band breaks down, maybe it's just the drum beat or maybe it's just the singer in the crowd and they'll say, oh, and they go, oh, you know, they do that back and forth thing, right? Yeah. So I thought, what if a guitar player could do that? Ah, that would so, be cool. Well, <laughs> it was, luckily, but I somehow, something told me it was okay to try that out for the first time at Donington. <laughs> <laughs> well, somehow, some way, shape or form, I decided to use that as part of my guitar solo at Donington. And so I get up there and I do this thing, you know, and I kind of make a motion like, you know, I want to hear you say and point to the audience. And people are kind of, you know, you could hear crickets at that time. <laughs> And then it just could have really gone bad. And then, oh, then I put my hair. One guy goes, oh, I go, point. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we keep doing it back and forth, back and forth. The next thing I know, it's like, it sounds like all 80,000 people. I go, then, oh, then, oh, oh. It was so cool. Uh -huh. But man, it was one of those things, like those scenes in movies where somebody tries something real risky and they can look like fools. Uh -huh. So when they first try, it really looks like, okay, this is going to be bad. You know, and then it ends up really good. That's exactly what that was like for me. It was just like, wow, this is going to be bad. <laughs> yeah. And it turned out really cool. It was great. Nice, nice. Now, you know, Craig, I mean, you when it you joined Ronnie with after Viv left, and what was it like, your first show with Ronnie walking out there? I mean, that had to be just nerve-wracking. Um, I mean, what was it like being a new member of the band at that time? Well, that was amazing in itself, all of it was amazing in itself um because for me being in deal wasn't a gig or, or a job or a weekly paycheck it was a dream come true you know you've heard this story before but maybe some of the uh, listeners there haven't you know i came from an abusive family avoiding stitches and more surgeries and, and, and injuries i slept in a car on the streets of san diego and then five years later headlining madison square square garden with my favorite singer ronnie james dio performing music that we wrote and recorded together so dreams come true so the theme of this whole thing is you know about how dreams can come true so like i said being in dio was a dream come true uh but the the and nerve-wracking yes um the very first show was actually on live television in the uk wow, wow. and my gear didn't clear customs oh, in oh, fact yeah. part of it got destroyed by a forklift oh no way so talk about nerve-wracking on top of nerve-wracking um and there was two guitars one had a Kaler bridge and one had a um a uh um a floyd rose left over from you know from what um, viv said he didn't want to take anymore mm. so the guitar tech had to build one guitar out of two so that way the one guitar left did have everything that 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 it needed i think there was like Oh, I, I, that's right. I think the Kaler had like a, there was a Kaler nut with a Floyd Rose bridge and a Kaler bridge with a Floyd Rose nut. <laughs> wow. Oh, nice, nice. And then six minutes before we go on live television, my rented gear shows up. <laughs> six minutes? Six minutes. Oh, wow. And I have that six months, six minutes to plug it all in and make sure it works <laughs> and, you know, Wow, and tune it, in. I'm, I'm glad that the, I'm glad that it, the YouTube wasn't really that big back then <laughs> because I was still a bit out of tune, and it, it wasn't exactly the greatest. But for me, it was. But that talk about. In fact, my alias name was they called me Nev, you know, because my, my nervous wreck. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Now. uh when you joined Dio, I mean, you had to play Viv guitar, Viv, Vivian Campbell part, guitar parts, some Rainbow parts, some Black Sabbath songs and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have a favorite? Did were any of those like, wow, man, I can't wait to play this one? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, you know, the obviously Stargazer, you know, because we didn't do Gates of Babylon until Rudy joined up, mm. but Stargazer. Um, and uh man on the silver mountain um yeah. uh don't talk to strangers i love that song you know yeah. and you know it's but you know I, I i've said this before but it's true you know my favorite guitar player everybody knows is blackmore but mm -hmm. picking a favorite song to do with ronnie is almost like saying if you had to choose only one which would you choose inhale or exhale oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
can, but I yeah, can. I mean, there's some sad. I actually got a chance to do "Lonely Is the Word" with with Ronnie in rehearsal before, because when he would go out with um, uh, Heaven and Hell, those guys lived in Europe and Ronnie lived in L.A., so we would actually rehearse some of the set list. So Ronnie would be nice and warmed up for that particular set list before he flew over to, ah. to join up with them. So I got a chance to do "Lonely Is the Word" with him and all sorts of stuff and. But in those days, yeah, it would it was like heaven and hell because there's this one part where the riff and the and the the verse uh, meet. Mm -hmm. It was a you know that part that don't you know that thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's only afterwards in the first section of the song. So then they put that together with the melody of this of the verse. And it's for me. I remember like everybody would remember they, where they were at nine eleven. Mm. <laughs> you know, when I heard that combination, I thought, "Wow, that's the coolest thing ever." So it's those things, really. You know, the Blackmore area era is really like the first album and, and Stargazer, and then of course get to Babylon, but we didn't do that until Rudy. Mm. And then Don't Talk to Strangers was just because it had everything, and yeah. and Last in Line too. Last in Line, yeah. Um, it's hard to say, but it was kind of cool because I, I stumbled across an interview that Ronnie did where he said that you know Rudy was the best bass player he ever worked with, second only to what a great guy he was, which is true. And he said he called me the best interpreter. I thought that was interesting, and now it kind of makes comes full circle why I get to answer that question because I guess Ronnie thought of me as the best interpreter for you know being at that time having to cover three guitar players yeah yeah nice exactly nice. Cool. And now this past week uh craig they had the hollywood screening of dreamers never die that uh right. that you went and saw now uh we haven't seen it as of yet but we are giving away tickets on today's show uh to the screening in madison wisconsin i guess my question is ha you know as you've seen the documentary how much involvement did you have in it, and did you think it really shone a good light on Ronnie? Do you think it was done well? Oh, yeah. The the documentary itself as a whole is very done well. In fact, I got a chance to talk to Don afterwards and just say me and my uh, fiancé were there. And we, at the time, it's probably different for everybody else, but we, after a while, you forget you're even watching a documentary because you're, you're really kind of listening to an audio story which is the, mm. which is the same thing but documentaries aren't exactly everybody's favorite because it has an element as if it is educational yeah uh -huh. not entertainment and i told don i go well you just created a new kind of documentary that requires a new kind of adjective because i don't have an adjective for you <laughs> <laughs> nice and uh, and i was surprised to have been in there as you know i'm not a lot but but the portions that i'm in i thought well okay that's cool that makes sense because they're trying to tell a story and and i everybody went in and did an interview and they used pieces of that interview you know to tell their story and so i felt really nice that it seemed to be pertinent whatever point they were trying to make everybody's piece in that you know in those interviews that were on camera were pertinent but i didn't ever really consider myself to be that pertinent to be a part that many times in the in the actual documentary me and my girlfriend were kind of our were kind of like well that was cool you know <laughs> nice 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 now i was watching a bunch of videos yesterday getting prepared for this interview and uh i watched the stars video the we are we're stars uh the charity thing you guys Hearing did aid. Yeah. Hearing aid, yeah and that was so cool i mean uh what was it like being in a room with all those great musicians? I mean, you had everybody pretty much. Every big name right. was pretty much there. I mean, Halford and, yeah, just go through the list. It, was, it, the top it really the was amazing. It really was amazing. It was like, you know, um, being in a Dracula in a room full of necks, you know. <laughs> you know like, yeah. That you is. know, um, but George Lynch scared me. Um, because um, when he was up next, you know, he was kind of like on deck, mm -hmm. so he was kind of practicing. And I happened to be in the control room at that time. 
I walked by and I heard what I could have sworn was a Wawa pedal. I thought, wow, cool. Is it okay, he's going to use a Wawa pedal on that. It's cool. I looked down the, on the floor expecting to see that pedal and there was none. Huh. And it was just the way he played. I was like, oh, man, are you kidding me? <laughs> scared the crap out of me. So I had to go back. But I'm glad that happened to me because I learned how to make vowel sounds. Uh-huh. You know, because, you know, music is a very, it's one of the highest forms of communication besides art So mm-hmm. and talking. <laughs> You know, yeah. so I was both grateful and scared as I, you know, blah, blah, tealess again. And, uh, but I was grateful for that, you know. And Neil, Sean, you know, we all had a, 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 we were all up to bat for that outro, but nobody can do outros like Neil, Sean. He just makes that guitar sing. Uh-oh. And so I was both in, intimidated and proud and humbled and, and privileged again, you know. And Ronnie said he brought me in play first because he knew I would start with a theme and not just start blowing, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Blah, right away, you know. Yeah. And he did that thing, you know, where, you know, grab my arm and like, see, that's why, you know. Yeah, you know. It was really cool. That I certainly was, I don't think my talent at that time deserved to be in that room, but it was nice to think that Ronnie thought so. And so the part that I played was cool. Yeah. But um, I really learned. I really learned just how out of my league I was, you know, or out of their league I was, you know. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. About that Bay, I mean, everybody was amazing. You know, it's just like, well, because you know, I I sound good on recordings because I work it out, mm-hmm. you know, and I play them live, and I and I maybe I'm impressive to some people because I can do what I do in the studio live, so people think that's cool. But my improvs were never really that great. Mm. Okay. All right. So, you know, that really taught me, you know, you know, I need to go back to the drawing board really to learn how to how to improv. And that did only, it only did good. There's a benefit to everything. But I just, you know, my if I if I if I let myself continue to be scared, my hands would have curled up inside of my wrists and I would have been un- unable to play. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I understand that. Hey, uh, Craig, it seems like a lot of bands from the 80s and some of the, from the 70s are going back to what they call the so-called vault, and they're finding right. unreleased material. Are there songs right. that you and Ronnie wrote and recorded that never were released that maybe we'll see the light of day sometime? Yeah, actually, I know. I think him and Doug have one. Him and Jimmy have one. Um, and actually, it's my... The one that I have stems into like the saddest and proudest point in my life. Because there was a point when the doctor gave Ronnie a clean bill of health and said, You can do whatever you want to do. And so we all thought he would go back to heaven and hell. You know, he's back in the 20,000 seat arenas and just sock away money as much as he can because they were making money hand over fist. And I was so proud of him being back on, on the stage like that again in those large crowds and the small venues we were we were playing. You know, not to say that, you know, being big is better. It's just, it's just, he's my friend. And so I want to see him do well in a, in a platform that he deserves. Hmm. And so when Wendy said, what do you want to do to Ronnie? We all thought he would say, let's go back, you know, on the road and, you know, so I can have some money for my retirement. He turns to Wendy and he says, I want to write with Craig. Huh. Wow. wow. Yeah. So now here we are writing Magic of Two together. Nice. And I can see that he's not feeling well, you know. Mm-hmm. And he's just, don't worry, Goldie. You know, I'm, I'm, it just happens. You know, I'll be okay. And so we were, this first song we were on only needed um, the vocal bridge to do it. And it would have been completed. And then the band would have recorded it. But I had these obligations with that band, um, Budgie, um, where they had already paid for the, the visas and ticket, you know, the airline tickets and everything was paid for. But I didn't want to go. And I was told him I was just going to, I was going to not go. Hmm. He said, Goldie, no, don't worry about it. You know, this will give me a chance to write more of the story. And it's only two weeks. So when you get back, you know, I'll have more of the story to write to because that's how we did it. He didn't have the whole story written the first time. Mm. He would add characters, and then that became, okay, we need to write a song for that character for that part of the story. So we were doing it again. It was just so amazing. 
But by the time I came back, he was in the hospital. And uh, the very next day, he died. Oh, man. That is sad. Man. Wow. So, you know, but to hear that from Wendy saying, mm. we asked him, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to write with Craig. So can you come up and play? I'm like, yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. It was so now you know what I mean by the both saddest and proudest moment. Yeah. So there is unreleased material, magic and material, and unreleased portions of him uh, narrating the story. Oh, okay. I hope that's so I'm sure the they'll just give the light of day at some point. Cool, cool. Now, uh, like I said, I was watching all these old, old videos and stuff, and um, the song, All the Fools Sailed Away. You think that song <laughs> could have benefited from maybe adding some cowbell? <laughs> you know, especially oh, right, at the, beginning, you. <laughs> right at the beginning. Right at the beginning where it's nice and yeah, mellow. Yeah, that gentle intro, that's what it's he, missing. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was Could you thinking. imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I can just hear Simon just hitting that. Just, yeah. Ding, oh, ding. Oh, 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 God, yeah. Noel, Craig, it's been an honor having you back on the show, and you know you're always welcome wow. here. And But we're, we Thank always you. let our, our, our artist, uh, our guest here, pick a song uh, out of the interview. Is there something off live uh, live at Donington you'd like to like us to play? Um. Actually, I'm going to leave that up to you guys. Surprise me. Oh, okay. What do you want to go with? Surprise man? me. Oh, I don't have yeah. the list in front Surprise of me. Surprise me. It's right behind you. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, we've, we're sitting here with the CD. I, I would, we, should we go with a Dio song or should we go with a rainbow tune? What do you want to do? Oh. How about a rainbow song? You want to do Man on the Silver Mountain? Why the heck not? All right. Well, Craig Goldie, you are always welcome here on Rock and Metal Revival, my friend. No, oh, thank you guys, man. I, I, you guys are like family, and you've heard me say I love you guys like brothers. You guys are great, so thank me, uh, thank you for having me on. 